Well, I'm joined now by Mike Esman, CEO of NFB Financial Services, and uh, we're going to be taking a look at a host of issues this afternoon. Let's perhaps, Mike, start off with what stands front and center right now. Focus for the markets here in South Africa are international events that are unfolding, and amongst them, Eurozone contagion fears. So let's get an update from your perspective on what you're making of what we're seeing unfold in Greece and the Eurozone. Um, good afternoon, Alicia. I think that our perspective probably is one which focuses on the individual, uh, on high worth and investors, pension funds and so forth. And I think that the uh, focus around uh, funds in South Africa has been that the local markets had a hang of a strong run. The currency has been extremely strong. Now it's time to look elsewhere, it's to look across borders, it's to look into other markets. Well, those markets are extremely distressed and, and just listening to Dave King earlier talk of a deferral and kicking the tin down the road has become the sort of the, 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 the popular comment in Europe is that's not just Europe, that's mm -hmm. the UK, that's the US of A and so forth. Um, so I think that what, what we have to do is be very, very careful to bet too strongly on a currency which we think, because it's weaker right now, is at its low ebb. Mm -hmm. um, it, it might not be. The truth in Europe is that those, the, the, the regulators, uh, I heard a comment the other day where they said, I wish I could get into a meeting with the f heads of finance of those countries uh, after they had a couple of glasses of wine and they were telling <laughs> the real truth. So, so sort of, you, know, you, you sort of think they're almost saying what's politically appropriate to say, having unbelievably tough discussions and meetings off record. And I think it's very, very dangerous to be betting heavily into any one of those currencies. So spreading risk by diversification right now must make a lot of sense. And so let's take a look at it. What do South African investors with Euro investments, what should they be thinking right now? What should they be doing right now? Well, the sovereignty of your investment, the actual safeness of your money right at the beginnings, never mind which share you choose, which property investment, which bank deposit you do, is, is my money going to be safe? If you go into equities, clearly you're taking equity risk, you're taking market risk and the share price as easily as it can go up, it can go down. If you put your money in a bank, you'd expect to put a hundred of or a million of into something and you'd expect to get that million back. Plus, depending on the interest rates and the country and, 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 and the tax regime, an amount of a return above that. Typically, that's going to be probably your most moderate investment. It's going to, uh, it's going to match return to risk. There's very little risk and therefore you probably accept a lower return. In a share, you'd get a dividend, mm -hmm. which if the shares, if you take 20 or 30 shares, you probably, maybe one or two of them in a real meltdown can disappear and collapse, but they're probably going to survive that uh, situation. If you put all your money in one bank and that bank gets into difficulty or that country can't support its banks because it's already done so for the last three years, you're in a very different place. So for wealth advisors and for people to make investment decisions, it's become quite tricky. Mm -hmm. It's almost safer to put your money in a range of shares or perhaps a whole bunch of banks than just one. Of course, uh, diversification, one of you know, the, 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 uh, the catchphrases right now where you've got to do that, you know, not put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, while those are some of the options offshore, let's take a uh, uh, look locally because we were talking about this topic last week where South Africa's listed property sector had sustained a run of 20% plus annual returns. Uh, sustainability of a run like that as you see it locally? Well, they've done remarkably well in, in testy times. So if you look at when the market melted uh, a couple of years ago, the equity prices of companies dropped 30 and 40 percent and mm -hmm. some more. Um, the listed property sector st uh, stayed very, very buoyant, well, relatively unscathed for a, a period of time. I would probably ascribe that to the fact that they do and have sustained very nice returns. Although prop listed properties don't pay a dividend, they pay an interest, uh, it's a debenture. Um, it, it after tax was still significantly better than having one's money in the bank and where some of the bigger shares, the, the so-called blue chips, were perhaps skipping a dividend or deferring a dividend, they were paying. Mm -hmm. So that payment cash flow uh, became very, very important and, and that helped sustain that sector. In the correction of the market, the property shares just again started leaping ahead. So they hadn't suffered the downside. Uh, they held their breath and then they resumed the charge when the, when the rest of the market found some degree of traction. Yeah. Uh, would you be uh, venturing into that space right now? It is expensive. Um, if I was there, 
and, and there's some very significant amounts of money invested in that space with some significant amounts of profit uh, banked already in terms of the safety buffer against a market volatility, I would probably stay the, the, the race. If I were a new investor, I would tread quite carefully in throwing a, a large lump sum investment into that sector in one shot. Of course, where investments have been directed, um, you know, it's towards high dividend payers, especially in this very volatile market environment we're seeing, uh, and we're seeing now an unwinding of dividend income funds, and that's caused some bit of controversy, some bit of debate, because now we've got these, uh, you know, these funds being, uh, well, discharged with interest being, or tax being charged on them. So run us through what's playing out there. Right, so, so the, these funds uh, and some very clever structuring was applied. The tax rules, kind of the law actually kind of accommodated that. Definitively, that's been changed. It, it's effective next April. And from that date forward, the so-called dividend that these funds churned out will be deemed interest mm -hmm. and taxed. There is room for certain of these funds to apply for exemption. Some of them might uh, well be accepted. Um, but the real essence of it was that we're saying, look, uh, if you have an, a cash flow into something and you're taking no commercial or market risk on the underlying share, how can you get out of that a dividend? You're not taking, so, so a person in a bank is happy to earn interest because it's safe and they, they, they're taking no risk, or risk I guess on the bank, but no market risk, mm -hmm. they're taking credit risk. If you buy a dividend fund uh, and, and what you get out is now called a dividend, that's not fair. So they've leveled the playing fields and, and these funds obviously cost the fiscus a lot of money. How do you see this affecting market activity when it comes to those uh, participation in those funds? Well, there's about 50 billion rands worth of private high worth and small medium corporate money that we're aware of in that market. There's probably another figure double that in off uh, commercial market uh, of that, off that radar screen. So it's a very significant change. That money has to go elsewhere. It's gonna have to find either alternative uh, sources of dividends to give the client, the investor, a tax efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, that might come or should come in terms of what the law says with commercial risk. If it comes without commercial risk, uh, the revenue authorities would be looking at that product yeah. in turn to, to try and change the status quo. There, are, there is a significant market in listed preference shares. The big banks and some of the bigger corporates have created listed preference shares. They are perpetually issued. They, uh, in other words, the bank or the issuer doesn't have an obligation to buy it back from you, so you have to go and find another willing buyer, willing seller. Mm -hmm. Those things track equities, and, they, and therefore they're not the same as a dividend income fund where you went in for one rand and you get one rand back. Uh, the price can change quite radically, so what's on the can needs to be carefully considered by the investor exiting dividend income funds.